Mr. Deputy, Deputy Governor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear John, uh, many thanks for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be able to address, to be here and to address this very distinguished audience. I am just surprised that a priori, a priori, my speech is considered to be controversial. <laughs> I, I, am, I am not used to that because I, I, I think I am almost never controversial. This, this, is, um, this is probably a mistake, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I am especially convinced that my political stances vis-a-vis -vis many issues of the current world have been becoming more and more mainstream. So, so I am afraid that the other speakers is, are controversial. <laughs> I am just, just someone who is not very aggressive. Second, uh, Mr. Deputy Governor, thank you very much for um, inviting us to be here in the, on the premises, in beautiful premises of the Hungarian Central Bank. Um, I am sure you know that that I entered recently into uh, some dramatic disputes with the Czech Central Bank. So I am surprised that the loyalty of central bankers is still not so great that they didn't stop my visiting your bank. That's really a very, very positive and positive surprise. So once again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I almost... I almost don't remember when I spoke here, I mean in Budapest last time, in a private capacity, not being on a formal state, state visit. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about why it is so. Um, it may be partly a personal problem because I entered politics in the moment of the Czechoslovak-Hungarian dispute, some of you still may remember, about, um, about Gabčíkovo, Nadmaroš, Danube Dam project, and I dared interpreting it as one of the standard conflicts between green ideology on the one hand, and rational thinking on the other, which was not very popular in Hungary at that time. So that may be one of my personal problems, problems here in this country. In addition to it, uh, there has always been a sort of competition between the Czech and the Hungarian concept of concepts of post-communist transformation and together with it, a missing mutual, mutual understanding of our specific approaches. I think it should be, it should be finally, finally recognized and accepted as a reality, not, not to be silent, not to be silent about that. It may also be non-personal, because the Czechs were always, for understandable reasons, on the side of Slovaks in all kinds of Slovak-Hungarian disputes. And I met yesterday in Bratislava the, Czech, the Slovak president, Kasparovic, when I told him that I will start my speech with this saying, he said, you will not be very applauded here in this, in this room. And uh, I must say that the, the, another point is that the Czechs looked with evident doubts and reservations at the Hungarian attempts to revive the almost century-old uh, story about the Trianon Treaty. We have always seen it differently. And there has also been a natural rivalry between the Czech Republic and Hungary about their role and position in Central European politics. So those may be the reasons for the fact that I speak much more often in Austria, Germany, Switzerland, United States of America, Italy, I don't know, Great Britain than, than in Hungary. On the other hand, and I think it's necessary to stress it, we have had similar views on Europe 
and on the European integration process. When I was here last time on my farewell state visit in December 2012, uh, my talks with all Hungarian political leaders showed me quite convincingly that our views on the EU are very close, and I would say closer this than with uh, uh, political representatives of other European countries. This must be also recognized and openly, openly stated. I don't know how Hungary celebrated the 10th anniversary of its EU membership a few days ago. And I hope to get some information about it during this visit of mine here. But in the Czech Republic, I must say there were no celebrations. Uh, with the exception of the current political elite, which vehemently tries to differentiate itself from the previous political leadership, which means from the former president, from the former right of center government, the support of the EU is at the lowest level ever and probably the lowest in the, in the whole European, European Union. The latest figure in the opinion, recent opinion poll that, uh, is that 28% of people believe in, in, the, in the European Union. I wouldn't say only. It's too much for me still. You know. um, I must say that we didn't find a motivation for any kind of celebrations. I had an in three interviews now in the last two hours with your journalist, and uh, one of the journalists asked me, uh, what do you say about the celebrations of the 25 years after the fall of communism and the 10 years of, of uh, entering the EU. My answer was, um, hopefully it will be published. Uh, my answer was, really, we plan to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the fall of communism. We just want to remind us of the 10 years of EU membership. So the difference between to celebrate and to remind is, is in my opinion, the proper description of the situation. I must say that serious analysis is missing and propagandistic statements are meaningless. We don't expect, however, that even a serious, unbiased, politically neutral cost-benefit analysis would give us a favorable outcome for the impact of our membership in the, in the EU. Such an analysis is, of course, technically and methodologically very complicated because of its multidimensional character. The EU membership was also not a controlled experiment. Um, we didn't live in a vacuum. Um, all other things were not kept equal, as we say in economic science. The ceteris paribus condition was not fulfilled. So to analyze it seriously uh, is, is almost impossible. At the same time, it is quite evident that we have not, 10 years ago, we have not entered, we didn't enter a healthy, prosperous, fast-growing economic area, area and we have not entered a truly democratic entity. I will try to develop these points a little bit. We also observe and can easily document that we have been getting almost every day new and new proofs of the loss of our sovereignty. In the first 10 years of our EU membership, we had to accept 3,600 European directives, 3,600, and were forced to pass almost 500 pieces of EU legislation. 
With growing despair, some of us witness the gradual reversal of our liberal reforms, which were done immediately after the fall of communism at the, be at the beginning of the 1990s, into a new form of government interventionism. In spite of our relatively successful fights with all versions of third ways 20 years ago, because we wanted to follow the first way, capitalism, we feel now that the EU membership brings us back from capitalism to a modern form of European socialism to a new administratively organized society. People like me have been afraid of all kinds of slippery roads, to use, to use the Hayekian phrase, the slippery roads which lead to socialism. It reminds me, and now I come to Hungary, it reminds me of my speech at the highly discussed and highly contested international conference about reforms in communist countries in February 1989 in Yer. Some of you may, may remember there is one, one hand, um, only one hand. All of you are too young to, you were not probably able to participate in a sophisticated event already in 1989. And uh, it reminds me the surprise in the audience in Yer when I quoted Hayek and ask for, for a truly Hayekian solution. I had a feeling then that the dreams about socialism were very strong there, and, uh, there in the audience, even among the well-respected reformers. Our sufficiently long experience with communism inevitably sharpens our eyes when observing today's EU. I have repeatedly criticized European politicians, European intellectuals, and European business people for not taking the evident problems connected with the current European integration process seriously enough. It is very frustrating for me that nothing significant has changed even when the failure of this project became so evident in the last couple of years. I am afraid we continue marching in the same blind alley as before, regardless the deteriorating economic data, regardless the waning respect and position of Europe in the rest of the world, regardless the deepening of the democratic deficit we are confronted with, and regardless the undeniable increase of frustration of people who live in Europe and are object of this immodest, progressivist, and constructivist experiment. The substance of my polemics with current European arrangements is based on the criticism both of the negative effects of the ambitions to economically centralize and unify European, the European continent and of the underestimation of negative consequences of the undemocratic suppression of nation states in favor of pan-European governance. After four decades of communism, when we were not free and sovereign. We wanted, I suppose, similarly to Hungary, to be a normal European country in a normal continent of free, sovereign, and naturally friendly countries. Our current situation is undoubtedly much better in the, than in the communist era. We live in a nominally free country now, but in spite of that, we feel new, not negligible constraints 
on our freedom. We have been losing our sovereignty again now, this time to Brussels, and the dictate of political correctness and the powerful role played by new modern isms such as multiculturalism, human rightism, environmentalism, homosexualism, aggressive feminism and genderism, etc. All of them based on old, perhaps, perhaps differently packed collectivistic, collectivist and freedom suppressing <coughs> concepts have been undermining and negatively affecting our feeling of being free. We are in an economic institution, in the central bank. There is, of course, an important economic dimension to it. More than 80% of our exports, I don't know how much is it in Hungary, 83.6% of our exports goes to the EU, which is by no means a flourishing economic area. This is a region which undergoes an already rather long economic stagnation and acute sovereign debt crisis. Even if we keep the Czech crown in a similar way as you keep the Hungarian foreign, we cannot disconnect ourselves from the developments in the rest of Europe. The Economic stagnation Europe is facing is not a historic inevitability. It is a man-made problem. It is an outcome of a deli deliberately chosen and for years and decades gradually developed European economic and social system on the one hand and of the more and more centralistic and undemocratic European Union political institutional arrangements on the other. They both, and especially they together, form an unsurmountable obstacle to, a f to any further positive development. What we go through is not an accident or a misfortune. It is a self-inflicted problem. It is a self-inflicted injury. Hundreds of small, at first sight, innocent details have metamorphosed into a serious systemic problem. It is evident that the European overregulated economy additionally constrained by a heavy load of social and environmental requirements, operating in a paternalistic welfare state atmosphere cannot grow. This burden is too heavy. If Europe wants to restart growing again, if Europe wants to solve its many daunting social problems, it has to undertake a far-reaching transformation of its economic and social system. This is my proposal number, number one. Far-reaching transformation of its economic and social system. Not less important is the fact that the excessive and unnatural centralization, bureaucratization, harmonization, standardization, and unification of the European continent has created a deep, more and more visible democratic defect, not just a democratic deficit. The term democratic deficit is an euphemism for me. It is much more than that. The end result of this is that we can't speak of democracy in Europe anymore. We entered a post-democratic or semi-democratic era, which was, of course, always a dream of socialists of all colors. This may become, in the long run, an even bigger problem 
than the current economic stagnation. And this is what I stress explicitly as an innocent economist who shouldn't speak about uh, uh, other, other issues. Um, changing it, which means changing the concept of the European integration, getting rid of the post-Maastricht development is the task number two in my understanding. Four months ago, on January the 1st, 2014, the EU architects and exponents planned to celebrate the first 15 years of the European common currency. But as far as I know, it went almost unnoticed. Euro evidently did not help practic practically anyone. On the contrary, it brought new problems. It weakened the self-discipline of individual countries. It produced an exchange rate structure which is too soft for the countries of the European North and too hard for the European South. Here we are in the central bank. I have to say that the European Monetary Union is nothing else than an extreme version of a fixed exchange rate system. As an economist, I have to argue that historically, that all historically known fixed exchange rate regimes needed exchange rates realignments sooner or later. This is quite evident historically. Eliminating um, the exchange rate, this powerful and for centuries functioning adjustment mechanism was a naive attempt to stop history, something which all the constructivist central planners, manipulators and dictators always wanted to achieve unsuccessfully. The economies of Eurozone countries have diverged, not converged, since the introduction of the euro. The erroneous belief that the very heterogeneous European economy could be, in a relatively short period of time, made homogeneous by means of monetary unification belongs to the category of wishful thinking. Europe can be made more homogeneous only by evolution, not by revolution, not by means of a political project. When discussing the current European problems, I find it wrong to concentrate on the well-known weaknesses of individual, individual EU countries. These countries did not bring about the current problems. These countries are the victims of the system of one currency. The system itself is a problem. These countries were forced to function in a world of, for them, unsuitable and inappropriate economic parameters. It proved to be untenable. Letting such countries leave the Eurozone in an organized way would be the beginning of their long journey to a healthy economic future. So to make it possible is my proposal and our task number, number three. Some critics say that it was a mistake to establish a monetary union whose members enjoy, according to them, incorrectly, fiscal sovereignty. They are therefore in favor of a genuine, full-fledged fiscal union and don't want to hear that the people of Europe want to retain fiscal sovereignty of their nations. 
If I understand it correctly, this is also the stance of the people of Hungary. Establishing a fiscal union in Europe should not be our task, on the contrary. Our task is, should be to, con to continue guaranteeing fiscal sovereignty of individual EU countries. I will, at the end, come to another issue. Because the issue of freedom in Europe gets a new relevance in connection with the recent developments in Ukraine. We are confronted with a blunt misinterpretation of events. Some people in Europe and America try to use Ukraine to restart a clash between the West and Russia. Ukraine with its long existing fragility, both in political and economic fields, has been denigrated to the role of an instrument in it. To force Ukraine into making a decision now whether the country belongs to the West or to the East is a certain and guaranteed way how to destroy it. I formulated it at the end of February, three months ago, quite resolutely. Giving Ukraine a choice between the East and the West means destroying it. It leads the country into an insolvable conflict that cannot have but a tragic ending. This is exactly what we see developing in front of our eyes. The mainstream media and politicians use the many times proved to be effective Orwellian newspeak. They try to tell us that they do intervene in Ukraine in an attempt to save or perhaps introduce freedom and democracy there. Whereas the only way to save or introduce freedom and democracy there would be to let Ukraine solve its own problems without foreign intervention, both from the West and from the, and from the East. I expect that someone will remind me now of the Russian behavior in Crimea and compare Soviet intervention into Czechoslovakia in August 68 with what happened in Crimea several weeks ago. It would not be fair. The recent violent political destabilization of Ukraine was not a genuine domestic political uprising, but an imported revolution. Its organizers had other plans and ambitions than to introduce freedom and democracy there. The Orwellian shift of causes and consequences is here, to my great regret, is here again. At the beginning of March, we formulated in, in a political statement of my institute in Prague, uh, of another think tank in Central Europe, uh, we formulated it in the following way. The sequence of causes and consequences is evident. It went from the events in the Kiev Maidan to the Russian troops in Crimea. Partial events should not be taken out of context. The problem is that the victims of this all is Ukraine and the people who live there. They didn't need it and they did not deserve it, even though the responsibility of Ukrainian politicians for not succeeding in solving the long-lasting Ukrainian problems for, for more than two decades after the end of communism is enormous and inexcusable. 
other victims of today's events are, I'm afraid, the European Democrats. The atmosphere of confrontation, danger and fear will be quickly misused to further accelerate European unification and to create a centralized European superstate with a rather limited right to hold an independent, an independent opinion. Today's artificially created atmosphere is bringing us closer to the brave new world so brilliantly described 80 years ago by Aldous Huxley, the Czechs, and I'm sure the Hungarians as well, who got rid of the communist version of the brave new world 25 years ago, know something about it. We are afraid that we are coming close to it again. To my great, the EU as an institution is to some respect responsible for it. We are often asked, I am often asked, what to do? What kind of concrete measures to implement? What to do tomorrow, day after tomorrow? I think this question is wrong. This question implies or assumes that such measures, such simple measures, do exist, which is not true. Mm, I, it, 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 it reminds me the last year of the communist regime. When the question came, what concrete measure to do? Our answer was, there is no such measure. measure. Simply, we have to change the substance of the, of the systems. And I'm afraid we are coming very close to that. The change in Europe must start differently. It must start by acknowledging that the whole system has failed and that the system must be changed. System. We need, and I suggest again, after 25 years to use the term transformation, which is already forgotten. Uh, we need a fundamental transformation of our thinking and of our behavior. We, I mean we in Europe. And uh, that transformation would require serious, free, and open political debates all over Europe, not blocked by political correctness or by old taboos and misconceptions. They must be generated by the people, not by the vested interests of EU politicians. Um, the forthcoming European elections may become one of the chances to do it, but I am afraid that the feeling of systemic failure is not yet sufficiently deep and widespread. The people still blame, blame Greece and not the EU system. All of that is also successfully blocked by the EU propaganda. Nevertheless, I don't want to stop this pessimistic outcome. I think in German, Optimismus is Pflicht. Optimism is a necessity. So I am, I am sure that all of us are optimists as regards the future. And especially we have, we all of us have to do something with it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. It was not provocative. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Well, you, I have to say you have lived up to my introduction, uh, Mr. President. Thank you very much indeed. That was indeed provocative, despite your uh, last-minute burst of optimism. And, and, I'm, um, and I'm, um, I'm sure it's going to evoke uh, uh, reactions for and against from the floor. So we have some young ladies with microphones and um, young people with microphones. And um, if uh, anyone who would like to ask a question would raise their hand. Um, we'll try to get the microphone to them. And if they would be kind enough when they ask the question to preface it with um, the, their name and if they represent an organization, the name of the organization they represent. So first of all, can I have the first question, please? Thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Kovach. I don't represent anybody, but uh, I had the honor and pleasure of listening to Your Excellency in Washington in 1989. You made a reference to your speech in Dior. I had a, the pleasure of listening to it in Washington. I think it was the Atlantic Council or some such uh, body of the good and the great. But uh, your speech then was a very clear rejection of the proposal for the coming from the left to uh, go along with Russia to uh, not be too aggressive or too strong in trying to become a Western country. And uh, I still remember your speech then, and I think uh, we and Eastern Europe and we in the West uh, owe you, have a, owe you a debt of gratitude for that. Uh, now, if I may turn to your present speech, um, about skepticism in Eastern Europe about the EU, which, uh, you know, for what it's worth, I agree with your arguments. But uh, when you consider how much money the EU is giving to these countries, I mean, Hungary is receiving something like 4 billion euros uh, net per year. That's about 4% of the GDP. It may be a similar number in some of the other countries. They're very high numbers. Uh, and this is, I wonder, uh, how long can this continue when you look at it from the Eurosceptic's point of view in Western Europe, who's saying, why are we giving all this money to these people? Uh, do you see that this, this monetary connection may, in fact, uh, slow down any attempts to reform or to uh, change things? Thank you very much. First, uh, I will. I, you mentioned uh, Euroscepticism. I, I try to refuse the term. Uh, I, I think it's not fair to speak about Euroscepticism and Euro optimism. And I always uh, suggest speaking about Euro realism and Euro naivism. And I am definitely not a Euro naivist, but it has nothing uh, in common with skepticism. How much money? I am, I am really, really shocked to speak about money we are getting from the EU. We made a serious analysis in our institute um, uh, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of our membership. I am absolutely shocked about your figure, 4% of GDP. I have never heard anything, anything like that. First, let's speak about net inflow of money, not gross inflow of money. You have to pay, you have to pay something to the EU. Uh, in our country, it's approximately 50-50, uh, half of that. So I guess, if I'm not wrong, I don't know the Hungarian data, that uh, you, when you speak about 4%, you should, you should uh, say it's half is the net inflow. I, I think it's impossible. I can tell you one, one figure. We in the Czech Republic were getting uh, get some, some sort of money. It is on the average in the 10 years, 0.85% of GDP annually. 0.85% of GDP. So I can't uh, believe that Hungary could uh, get uh, four times four times more, even if I don't know the data. So I, first, I would say that this is the gross inflow of money, not net. But but you should know it. You should know it better. Definitely, the Hungarian GDP is lower 
lower than the Czech GDP, which means that you can get more money from the from the EU than the than the than the Czechs. That's probably that's probably true. But I am absolutely sure that your four percent is is a is a mistake, and I I would be very pleased to use my next two days here in 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 Budapest to to know more about that. Second, uh, second. If you look at the EU money, I don't know what's the experience of Hungarians. At least in the Czech Republic, there is a much disagreement with the way how the money are used. What are the project financed by by means of of the of the European money coming to our country? They are not used for serious projects. The main main item, at least in the Czech Republic, and it's the slogan in the country, is that the main uh, main effect of the EU money is the in the Czech Republic is something which is very easy, something which is. Uh, considered um, positive in any respect. So the main uh, main use of EU money in the Czech Republic to to is to build the bicycle bicycle uh, paths uh, roads in uh, near the villages and cities. Whenever I I came, wherever I came in, as president of the country uh, to the small village, the mayor of the village of the small city said to me, we built. A bicycle, bicycle road around around the country. So uh, I don't want to trivialize the issue. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the one of the big problems is the way how the money is used, because the 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 priorities where to put it is 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 in the hands of the EU officials, not of not of our officials. That's my first point. Second point. I don't know whether you have the same, ex oh, I'm sure you have the same experience. One of the m most important features of the EU, EU fiscal transfers is the so-called co-financing. I would be very pleased if the EU decides we built this project. We made all the necessary and cost-benefit analysis and we decided that this project is okay. No. They push the countries like Hungary and the Czech Republic to co-finance in, in a way which, which, which many of our institutions and uh, organizations simply don't want. And they, they, when they get some money, so they are forced to add their own 35% or something like that, which could be used in a much more positive, positive way. I can continue, but for in our feeling, uh, there is another important aspect of that, and this is the fact that the European money is the main source of corruption in our country and elsewhere in Europe. This is such a negative aspect. The whole rebellion against communism, the whole, the whole. Our, our velvet revolution was to desubsidize the economy. I was Minister of Finance. To desubsidize the economy was the main slogan. I was preaching on all the main squares in the uh, Czechoslovak cities at that time, down with subsidies. We are really getting subsidies again, which is for me uh, the terrible result of our 25 years living in a sort of free society. And this is just the question of money, of the fiscal fiscal transfers. Uh, but the, our membership in the, in the EU has many intangible costs and benefits, of course, which are very difficult to measure, which are very difficult to quantify. And I am afraid that the, the introduction of the EU very regulative uh, legislation is a cost which is practically uh, liquidating uh, the, the Czech economy and the European economy as such. So, so I, I think that to speak about EU money is only not, not in my understanding, necessary at such a sophisticated meeting like this one. 
Thank you. And, and, and now a question from this gentleman here, just by the camera, and then there's another gentleman right at the very back after him. But, but first, uh, the question and answer here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bamer Benz. I work for Here TV. Uh, Your Excellency, I have two questions. Both of them are connected. The first one is that in light of the Russian behavior, recent Russian behavior in Ukraine, don't, don't you think that uh, now is the time for a strong and united Europe, more than ever? And uh, the second question, which is connected, that the predict predicted uh, rise of the so-called Eurosceptic parties in the European elections, don't you think that uh, this serves Russian interests by weakening of, of Europe? Thank you. Yeah, I will start with the first question. First, the second question, you know. Well, I think that uh, for many of us in Europe, the, the, the European uh, democratic deficit on the one hand, uh, the, the total economic lack of success, uh, stagnation, and so on, uh, is something which is in our interest to solve, and and the more criticism, the better. So I can't imagine to connect it with Russia in any in any way. This is almost an incredible. It's like a communist way of thinking. You are from the official Hungarian TV, I guess. No, private. This is even worse, you know, <laughs> in this respect. Yeah. I don't know. I. I, I, I definitely am. I am not an advocate of Russia or, or Mr. Putin. Really, really, really not. Uh, I, I would, I would strongly argue that I uh, try to be the advocate of rational thinking and advocate of telling truths, not lies. You know. That's my, that's my position. What do you see in the Ukraine done by Russia today? I am absolutely sure that Russia must be extremely unhappy with what is going on there, and I am sure that the Russian politicians are preaching overnight. Please don't, don't. Uh, uh, they try. They are think, hoping that nothing will happen then, and they they wouldn't be forced to do something, and and so on. So. I don't see any dramatic Russian, acti Russian activity in the Ukraine just now. This is just you are you are accepting the 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 untruths done in the mainstream media in Europe and America. I am sorry to say that. Thank you, um, the gentleman right at the back, um, who may bring about the changes that you have described to us, or you are done with the Commission. And another question is. Uh, Pro-Europeans are saying that Europe is based on European Union is based on peace, basically, and that's the primary function of it to protect peace in Europe, as it is based on the peace between France and Germany. So, what's your argument to them? Thank you. A politician on the right of political spectrum, of course, I would be the last one to vote for Mr. Schulz. You know that that's quite. Uh, uh, quite evident, and he is ideologically my arch enemy for, for for years or decades. So, in this respect, I am definitely more on the side of Mr. Juncker, who, who we were together ministers of finance at the, at the beginning of the 1990s. So, I, at least I know him. But uh, for me, for me. I am not very much interested in in who will be the 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 boss of the European Parliament. This is not a real parliament, and uh, and in this respect, it's almost irrelevant who will who will be who will be the the, the leader of the European Parliament. It's it's below. Uh, this answer, this question, is below my I would put it below my sensitivity level. <laughs> uh, I, 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 but nevertheless, ideologically speaking, Juncker versus versus uh, versus, I would vote for Nigel Farage to be the to be the, <laughs> the, the, the chair of the of the European Parliament, if you if you want. The second question is, I don't know. Uh, I know that this this issue is this this argument, this point is repeated very often. 
in Europe, but I don't believe it's, it's a genuine question. Do you really think that the, the European Union has any connection whatsoever with peace in Europe? This is beyond my imagination and beyond my fantasy, really. The European Union is a centralistic, bureaucratic, uh, regulative institution, and the connection with peace in Europe is, is zero, non-existent. I, I know that some European politicians have been repeating that issue for, for decades, uh, but, uh, but uh, if something, well, I, I think that Europe uh, learned something from the, from the two world war v wars in the 20th century, and especially one, uh, one institution which blocked uh, war in Europe is NATO, not the European, not the European Union. And I'm afraid the more we will centralize Europe, the more danger there will be of having a war in Europe again. Thank you. Another question, please. Um, I see there are a lot of questions now. Um, there are uh, the gentleman in the white jacket there, and, the, and then something later, the lady behind him. Yes. My name is Bradian Eminger. I'm professor at the Corvinus University of Economic Science in Budapest. I have just a short question to you, Mr. President. I think you have spoke from our heart from the most Hungarian people. I'm afraid not from the mainstream media. That's my opinion. My question is, you are one of the best known representative of Eurocriticism. And you said Eurorealism. My question is shortly, who are the comrades, your friends in European policy concretely? Thank you. Thank you. Difficult question. Uh, sometimes they, they, I don't know, do you use the phrase the kiss of the death? Or how, how, <laughs> yes. how you say Kiss of death is a kiss common of English death phrase. Kiss is, is an English phrase, so I'm afraid to name someone not to, not to <laughs> spoil his reputation, so don't ask me for, don't ask me for, for that, you know. That, that's, a, that's a problem. <laughs> Nevertheless, as I, as I really, as I said, uh, when I was here together with my ambassador, there is a Czech ambassador, Mrs. Bambasova in Hungary, when I was here on a farewell state visit in December, December 2012, which is some 15 or oh, 17 months ago, uh, I, I was really positively surprised to meet all the leading Hungarian politicians. And I think that their views are closer to me than to my views than of any other of any other European European politician at the first level, at the level of, of heads of states or heads of governments. Uh, we used to have a good friend, President Kaczynski in Poland, and his his loss is tremendous, I think, for all of us in Central Europe and especially and in the in the whole Europe. I know politicians at the lower level is views which are very similar. The tragedy is that um, many of those politicians, um, they have, I think, very rational views in private, but they are very often afraid to say it openly and to, and um, this this is a big problem I, I I feel here in Europe, not just about about the about the the European issues, about the nonsense of global warming and then things like that. You know, I wrote a book about about the nonsense of the ideology of global warming, with the title. Um, um, blue planet in green shackles. You know, the book has 20 translations all over over the world, even in such countries as, as I don't know, as Indonesia and and Japan and China. 
probably the only language where it was not translated is Hungarian, which I, I guess that I guess that that you are on the other side of the barricade. Nevertheless, I remember I I, I had a long speech at the at the General Assembly in New York City once several years ago, and. Um, it was the only, it was the whole day devoted to the global warming, and I was probably the only one who, who openly criticized it. Then there was a big reception in the evening um, organized by U.S. president, and we, we were waiting there for hours almost. And, and one after another, uh, leading politicians uh, came to me, thank you very much for saying us what you said this evening. I fully agree. And I ask him, and why don't you say that also? In our country, it's not possible. <laughs> yeah. So this is my problem of naming uh, politicians with some, I would say, more rational views on the European issues. There are some, definitely. Economists. Well, the economic profession discovered um, uh, in its in its rent seeking uh, uh, rational behavior the economic uh, profession discovered that it's very positive for them to entertain the Brussels leaders and to 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 become their advisors and to write studies about that. So I am afraid that many economists are spoiled by the EU by the EU money. <coughs> Nevertheless, there are some quite visible visible polit uh, economists and my good friend Professor Sin from München, Munich is is definitely definitely one of them many members of the Mont Pelerin Society and so on. There are some. Yes, um, thank you. The, um, the lady just behind the last questioner and then the gentleman here and the gentleman there. Thank you, my name is Julia Lakatos from Center for Fair Political Analysis. It's also a think tank in Hungary. And to come back a little bit to a theoretical question, you mentioned that change in the European Union can only come through institutional and structural change. But you also said that it cannot be a political experiment and that it has to come in an evolutionary way. So how do you imagine evolution? How are we, with many different historical experiences, going to find uh, strength to change? Thank you. Well, as, as I said, definitely uh, the Europeans must get the feeling of the real problem, which is not yet the case. When the Europeans, in, especially in Western Europe, but in our two countries as well, still have a chance to go every year to Mallorca or, or Canary Islands, uh, there will be no revolution. You know? So probably we, the, the European economy must go even more down uh, to... to, to show the people that there is a real problem. Uh, I think the, our, our implicit, um, implicit um, uh, someone who will help us in, uh, uh, will probably be the success, the evident and visible and fastly growing success of non-European nations. Uh, definitely the European train goes very slowly. It almost stops, you know. The trains in, in Asia, in Latin America, I think very soon in Africa, go much faster and at one moment, and at one moment uh, the huge difference will be will be visible and I, I hope this is this is the reason for some optimism for some optimism for us. I, I don't believe that it's possible to accelerate the, the European economy uh, with the European or perhaps originally German soziale Marktwirtschaft. This is for me absolutely impossible and uh, I was always 
fighting at the beginning of the 1990s, uh, the famous, my slogan, famous slogan, well, contested, of course, was market without adjectives. Some of you may remember that, that phrase. So the soziale marktwirtschaft, that model, now augmented by all the crazy environmentalist argumentation, is, is, uh, is, um, is something which the European economy cannot survive, and uh, regardless of rational or not rational monetary policy, so anything like that, it will, it will, it will not help. So, so um, I think that um, it it needs the feeling of the people that that it's really wrong. That was my comment, saying that it's wrong to blame Greece for creating the European problems. Uh, Euro uh, Greece is, uh, uh, did not create the European problems. Greece is the victim of the straight jacket of of. Uh, of single single currency, uh, simply as I said, for the economic profession, uh, my argument that the, the, the monetary union is just an extreme extreme version of of the fixed exchange rate system, I think is valid, and I am sorry to say that I don't hear it hundred or thousand times to be to be repeated, and uh, uh, some people say there is not enough literature on, on, on monetary unions. I would always tell them that uh, Robert Mandel 1961 article about uh, optimal currency areas is, is sufficient. For, but, but it is not true that there is not enough literature about uh, the problems of monetary unions. There, is, there are not many topics in the economic science in the last two centuries, then the topic fixed versus flexible exchange rates. Anyone who has studied economics knows that the topic of fixed versus flexible exchange rates is, a, is one of the fundamental topics of the economic science in the last two centuries. And the arguments in favor of fixed or flexible exchange rates are well known. And uh, or the economists at least should know those those arguments, and the monetary union is the, is an extreme fixed exchange rate regime, and uh, uh, we have experiences in the past. We have experiences in the recent decades. And, uh, I I found very interesting an analysis done done recently by an Australian German origin economist who made an excellent point that in the last 25 years before 25 years before the launching of the euro in 1999 minus 20 minus 25 um, the, the, he he made an perfect analysis how much the main European currencies devalued vis-a-vis -vis the German mark. And, and in those 35 years, French franc by 82%, uh, uh, the Italian lira by maybe more, uh, the Spanish, Spanish um, peseta was, was it uh, even more, and so on. In the 35 years before entering the, the Eurozone, and then everyone expected a miracle that all the necessary adjustment of exchange rate would stop forever, and those countries would be able to live together with one exchange rate. Impossible, this is only for children, even for children, it seems to me. Easy to easy to understand. So, uh, I don't know. To, to, so to say that Greece demolished, damaged the European Union is is a nonsense. You know, and Greece, the poor people in in Greece are the victims of the system of one currency, which is a real straight jacket for for them. So, I don't know. You have to preach those ideas in Hungary in. 
Now, we only have time, I think, for a, a few more questions. And I'm going to say the gentleman there, gentleman, uh, well, I'm afraid it's you. Well, uh, if you would be the second speaker, sir, and then the lady behind you. So this gentleman here. And perhaps we could take all three questions, one after the other, um, because we all are running out of time. So Thank if, you. If I remember them, you know, as an <laughs> old man, you know. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Chaba Kans. I'm a freelance uh, financial consultant. And uh, could I, Mr. Klaus, uh, challenge you on your point uh, when you said that uh, the European project has uh, contributed uh, to an extent of zero, practically zero, uh, to European peace uh, in the last 60 years, <clears throat> which I find really a, a bit outlandish, but anyway, I mean, uh, that's your point. Um, uh, don't you think that it's, it's, it's a kind of historic pattern that whenever uh, the economies are cooling down, when boom uh, turns to bust or stagnation, uh, national elites try to divert social tension to the outside world and uh, uh, former uh, national grievances or national um, rivalries turn into hot issues. That's what we see these days in Gnosis, uh, Gnosis Asia, uh, where they do not have uh, supra supranational security and economic uh, slash political uh, institution. Uh, whereas here in Europe, uh, we had a kind of functioning uh, German uh, Franco uh, agreement and the kind of uh, peace process. Um, so don't you think that uh, it, it did uh, contribute? Okay. Uh, sorry. Can, you, can you wrap indeed, up quickly? Thank you. Indeed. Uh, to, to the uh, question. Uh, I see your point on, on uh, several critical points on, on federalism. Don't you think that uh, instead of this kind of US type of federalism, which, which has uh, which it doesn't have its roots in, uh, in Europe, a kind of Swiss-type uh, federalism uh, would suit more to the continent. Thank you. Thank then you. the gentleman here in the... Um, uh, thank you. It, it, you are being past the microphone. It's just behind you. <laughs> uh, I am Peter Kleckner. Uh, first of all, uh, President uh, Klaus, I would like to thank for your presentation, uh, which was uh, very, very stimulating for me. So I, I thank you very much. Uh, and you, you have mentioned that um, it absolutely uh, would be necessary to change the system of the European Union for our future. I, I agree with uh, the statement, with the sentence, but I'd like to add uh, something to this statement that means we are, we are in the European Union. We are inside. Your country and our country is also inside. That means we have the task to change the European Union. And in, in connection uh, with this statement, uh, I'd like to, to put a question about, uh, to you about the, your opinion about the Visegrad Four cooperation. Uh, what is your opinion? Can the Visegrad Four countries uh, to help uh, to, re, uh, to help uh, in reaching the development of, of the right development of the European Union in the future. Thank you. And would you pass the microphone to the lady behind you? Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Anna Shai and uh, I'm just asking this question out of personal interest. Um, you said that you weren't being provocative, so let me be. Um, <laughs> As um, you, you said that essentially, if I understood it correctly, essentially what you said it's, is that speaking about um, a deficit of democracy is an understatement. And also you seem to be um, have a liking um, of the word Orwellian. So um, do you think that the EU, or a bit more broadly speaking, those isms or ideologies, and let me be quite provocative indeed, but do you, th do you think that they have a tendency or a capacity to uh, force, enforce, or, or uh, generate in any way totalitarianism? Thank you. And Mr. President, if you'd like to make this your final remarks as well. Final remarks. So we will, we will 
have at the end totalitarianism. <laughs> that's a, that's a, <laughs> um, so I, I probably must be very, very quick and very short. I really don't believe the seriousness of uh, and sincerity of the arguments about peace. This this is really beyond my grasp, beyond my my understanding. Um, I don't see anything peaceful. It's just political opportunism of the current political European leaders when they have no other good argument in favor of the European Union to to start speaking about 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 the war in Europe. This is such a cheap uh, argument that I, I almost don't understand that someone can 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 do it. So I. I, I'm sorry. I, I I don't think it's necessary to speak to speak about it anymore. This is simply not not true. To diverge, if if I follow your 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 questions, to diverge, uh, uh, you you somehow suggested that the unsuccessful uh, national leaders try to di diverge diverge. Uh, um, in in a case of social tensions, try to diverge the guilt to to someone else. <laughs> I must say that my criticism of the of the European project is really identical. In the last twenty five years, maybe I find new arguments. Uh, my, I discover new phrases, but if you take my speeches in 1990, where there was no euro, no no uh, six years of uh, fatal economic stagnation in Europe, no 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 um, indebtedness of uh, of European countries as it is as it is now, simply uh, my arguments are very similar, but. I'm afraid that the Europe has dramatically changed since that time, and there is a, a much more need for criticism. I am I see it quite differently. I am afraid that the European leaders in Brussels and their fellow travelers in individual EU countries are tr trying to diverge the social tensions into some 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 topics uh, just on the contrary just opposite of what you say i am i am not a, i am not uh, ready to uh, to suggest uh, to suggest um, um, whether the U.S. type of federalism is is better than the Swiss type of federalism? I was last week making three speeches in Switzerland, and they always want, they all wanted me to convince that the Swiss way is the is the best. Okay, uh, but uh, I must say that I am very much against all kind of federalism in Europe. To be quite explicit, I think federalism belongs to the to the United, US, United States. Federalism belongs to Germany. Federalism probably belongs to Austria, but federalism does not belong to Europe. Don't don't speak. Why why do you suggest federalism? It's again. A, Leftist socialist dream. Uh, the, uh, this is the easiest way how to how to uh, turn the whole continent into into a socialist uh, paradise by m introducing federalism. So I, I am not in favor of federalism. Uh, it, to to have a different speech, I would I would I would. Uh, I would start speaking with my with my more general views about the European Union. I am definitely very much in favor of the first era of the European integration process in the 1950s, 60s, uh, 70s, partly 80s, which was opening up 
liberalization, deregulation, eliminating of all kinds of barricades uh, at the borders of individual EU countries. I am very much in favor of that and definitely that was a positive contribution of the European integration process. But with the French socialist Jacques Delors in the late 1980s, it has turned to a totally different integration and especially as it is in Maastricht Treaty, simply the, the liberalization and the deregulation phase of the European integration process transformed, metamorphosed into something totally different. Unification, homogenization, standardization, and so on, and so on. So, so I am afraid we, the European Union has two faces. One of them is positive one, opening up. Europe, the other one is just the opposite, controlling, regulating, over-regulating, centralizing Europe. So I am very much against all kinds of federalism and I suggested in, in my uh, recent book, which was translated already into seven European languages with the title uh, European Integration Without Illusions. The book is in Czech, English, German, Italian, Spanish, Polish, Bulgarian, Russian, I don't know. So, well, no Hungarian, of course. <laughs> I, am, I am a persona non grata in Hungary, I think. You know. uh, no, I know that the Hungarians can read all those languages, so it's not necessary for a sophisticated country to, to <laughs> translate books. The unsophisticated countries must have books in their own language, isn't it? Isn't it so? Uh, so I, I suggested really not a European federation. I suggested in a broad terms something what for the lack of better title I called OEC. Organization of European States, which means returning from supranationalism to intergovernmentalism again. That would be my my dream and my proposal <coughs> and my my suggestion to do something in Europe. So OEC, OES, sorry, <laughs> Organization of European States. Um, we have to change the EU. No one else would, would do it, uh, definitely not, not the Americans, not the, not the Russians, not the Chinese. Um, um, I, I, I recently, we had recently in Prague a Czech, do we have five minutes? Yes, Mara? absolutely. We, we had recently in Prague a Czech-Chinese investment forum and a very sophisticated person, the first deputy minister of, of foreign affairs of China was there. And we, we talk about some, some problems in the EU. And the Chinese guy listened to, to me and the prime minister. We were sitting together and he said, well, it seems to me that you have to make a revolution in Europe. It was very, very, very interesting and shocking to see that someone from China sees the European problems. Um, uh, he really, the, and I, I, I think that more and more people understand it. We have to change no one, no one else. Uh, we had to change our countries after the fall of communism. No one helped us uh, at all, really. And, uh, and uh, all the advices uh, were, were more or less irrational. I, I came to Hungary, to Budapest, for today's conference, which is done uh, with the title um, Transition in Retrospect, and they ask all the leading reformers of the 1990s to submit a long uh, study. And there will be a book published in the United States by the Peterson Institute for International Economics in the autumn. And we are supposed to discuss our, our papers we submitted. Transition in retros retrospect. So we, we have to say that we were not helped by anyone. The role of the rest of the world was marginal, if any. 
and the cont positive contribution really not. I, I was joking, and we were absolutely happy after the fall of communism that some immediately overnight the visa regime was was uh, eliminated, and after three years sitting in the Ministry of Finance, and uh, hundreds of of uh, rent-seeking advisors. Uh, in would-be mm. investors when were uh, coming and try and try to to help us to advise us what to do and I was joking at that time probably we have to reintroduce the visas just for this specific group of people for the foreign advisors you know because they were not advising us they were advising themselves <laughs> So it is our task, or otherwise we could stay at the periphery of the world, and I'm afraid we are very quickly go to there. Visegrad Group. I was at the very beginning uh, criticizing the idea of Visegrad Group uh, for uh, a very simple reason, because um, it is not true that the Visegrad Grouping came as a genuine idea from below, it is not true. We were somehow pushed by Western Europe, by the EU, to start the Visegrad cooperation to demonstrate as a waiting room for the EU membership. And we were pushed to, to demonstrate that we are ready to cooperate and to be friendly and I don't know what. So it was not motivated from below. It came from, from, from Western Europe. And uh, this is something that I was not ready to swallow. So that's, that's my point. Nevertheless, I think that the, the better the cooperation the four Central European countries would have, the better for all of us. But I attended tens, more than tens, uh, Visegrad group meetings, and I must say that they were always just the polite, uh, friendly discussions, but uh, without any any real interest in 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 doing something together, which I was very angry, and I always try to push all my counterparts from Poland, Hungary, and Slovakia to do something together. They were making nice speeches about Visegrad grouping, and I was the only one who was trying to to push them into something. No, no one. Was, was interested. So to my great regret, Visegrad Group doesn't play any role. I'm sure that the four Visegrad Group presidents and prime ministers would say, no, that's not true. We are very important in the EU. This is not true, I must say. Final question, democratic deficit, all the danger, dangerous isms, Europeism. This is a, a term which I tried to propagate, to promote. Uh, I, I had a feeling that I came to that term on my own independently. Then I discovered that John published <laughs> an excellent article in the Australian monthly <laughs> journal, The Quadrant, which I recommend to anyone one of the best <laughs> liberal you. monthly journals in Europe. And I discovered that he used the same te term more or less in a, a similar period of time. And um, I, I, this Europeanism as an unstructured, implicit, not explicit uh, European um, ideology, uh, because of its implicit character, uh, it's... Uh, very easy to use in the mm. argument, is a conglomerate of all those isms this young lady mentioned and I mentioned in my, in my presentation. So I am very much afraid of the, them. So communism is over, Marxism is over, but those uh, isms are based on, a, on very similar attitudes, approaches, ambitions, and um, I am afraid. I wouldn't speak about totalitarian regime tomorrow, but the, 
it started with the democratic deficit. Now I will speak about semi-democracy or post-democracy. And I'm afraid we would come very soon to a more and more elitist authoritarian regime where democracy will be just just something not, not very serious. I think it's sufficient. So thank you very much. Um, um. L ladies and gentlemen, before I close the meeting, I just want to say a couple of things. The first is that there's coffee and light refreshments here. We hope you'll join us in enjoying them. Uh, secondly, um, I don't think I need to make the case that this was a, a gripping uh, occasion. I see that um, your reactions are following it all the arguments closely were very clear from the platform. And secondly, I see the deputy governor was so um, impressed that he completely forgot he about he his appointment and, his, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, is, is still here. And um, finally, um, the, uh, a remark that um, you made, Mr. President, reminded me, your, your discussion of the um, kind of orthodoxy of opinion reminded me that when I was covering the accession debate in Hungary, um, I said to a, a politician at the time, uh, I said, um, if all of the political parties are in favor of accession, who's against it? And he said, oh, the nation. <laughs> now, of course, that's not true, in, strictly speaking, but it is true that there is a kind of orthodoxy that gets, so to speak, uh, 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 is imposed by a kind of osmosis. And, and we do require people who are willing to speak out against it and are willing to express their opinions and willing to take part in a genuine and vigorous debate. Uh, Mr. Mr. Um, President, you have demonstrated again tonight, but you had demonstrated it many times before, that you're one of the politicians, one of the leaders who are prepared to do this. And even those who disagree with you violently, and I don't think there were many in the audience, but even those who disagree with you are in your debt for willing to take part in this debate, stimulate it, and make it real in political life. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.